can't see you, but clearly you're the optimistic members of this summit. Um, in my past life as a science journalist, I attended quite a lot of talks on how to make cities greener. And they followed a certain pattern, which was never boring, but certainly became familiar after a while. There'd be one or two examples of environmentally friendly technology. Um, you might hear about green walls or wooden skyscrapers. You'd have some examples of good practice. People would talk about places like Utrecht and Oslo. But always there was this sense of incremental change, things getting a little bit better with every passing year. Well, things are very different now. The pandemic has accelerated some trends, it stopped others, and it started a number of new ones. And um, today we have um, a very diverse panel, including two policymakers in city government um, and a vice president of the European Investment Bank and um, a country manager from a mobility company who will guide you through some of these changes. A quick note on the format of um, today's panel discussion, because we are going to be under quite significant time constraints. There will first be brief opening statements from each of the speakers, and then there'll be a series of structured questions to go through, particularly some of the central issues that have been raised by the pandemic. And then uh, there'll be an opportunity for members of the audience to um, ask questions to the panelists. We also, I believe, have an electronic poll which is as follows. Um, should low carbon emission vehicle zones be introduced into all of Europe's major cities? And I hope to give the panelists uh, an opportunity to uh, provide their own thoughts on that subject. Um, given the time constraints, I would like to ask everyone involved in this discussion to please keep their contributions as concise as possible. And if anyone watching online has uh, trouble with their audio, I'm told that you can refresh the live stream page and that ought to sort it out. Um, so I think we will go straight to um, Councillor Blake to open the opening presentations. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much Oliver and it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon and um, to, um, to be among friends um, talking about this very important agenda and I'm delighted that um, I'm able to represent the work that Leeds is doing on this agenda and I very, uh, very firmly believe that cities need to be at the forefront of leading um, the work in this area. Um, Leeds declared a climate emergency in March 2019. And I think it's fair to say that since then, we've seen a step change in interest, in um, influence, um, incredible upsurge of, um, of activity from young people in the city in particular. Um, and I just um, want to say one of the reasons why I believe that cities have such an important role and, and particularly the democratic organisations is um, that we can come up with the best policies, the best evidence, um, but if we don't take people with us on this journey, then we're not going to succeed. And um, I just want to outline some of the approaches we've taken very briefly um, to make sure that we're not just preaching to the converted, I've been in too many meetings mm -hmm. where I've asked the question, was anybody skeptical about this agenda before you came in the room? And too often, um, people who come are already convinced and signed up. And what we have to do is reach the people who aren't. Um, so we um, set up our big Leeds climate conversation, um, taking it right out um, into the, um, the widest areas of Leeds. Leeds is the second largest city in England um, in the UK outside of London. Um, so we have a very large geographic area, very different communities. And um, that climate conversation over 80 meetings and reaching a range of people we've never met, never met before. We also set up a citizens jury, um, presenting um, evidence to them and asking them for their, their verdicts and their conclusion. And we have, I think, um, one of the groundbreaking institutions now, um, the Leeds Climate Commission, which is a, a venture uh, very much run by Leeds University and um, Leeds City Council, bringing together all of our partners, um, world leading academics in the field of climate science, um, preparing our evidence base. Um, but the other major factor that I have to say um, we have other examples that might come out in the questions, of course. We have to lead by example on the council. It's absolutely essential that we get our own house in order. But what we have to do is make sure that the whole debate is framed in uh, language 
that is relevant to people's lives. And particularly now with the stress and the pressure um, that people are facing by um, the consequences of the pandemic, we have to make sure that we're not just talking about carbon emissions, as important of course as that is, but we're also talking about better quality housing, affordable, accessible transport, um, green jobs, absolutely critical, health, how important is the health agenda right now? And of course, addressing poverty. So um, I would just say that our role as a, the democratic leaders is to go out and seek permission from the people we represent to bring in some really life-changing new systems, new ways of working, new ways of moving around. And I think if we can work together on that, then we have um, a great deal of opportunity and um, hope for success to achieve our ambitions to become carbon neutral. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mayor Jib, the, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great opportunity for me to share with you a few ideas on this critically important topic of the green transition and the role of the cities in it. And uh, yes, we are now dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. However, I believe it's crucial not to lose sight of other key challenges. And the city of Prague, under the current leadership, uh, has been putting a strong emphasis on tackling this issue and these challenges linked to climate change. So the last year, city council had adopted the climate change, the climate pledge to reduce CO2 emissions by at least 45% by 2030 and to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And this is significantly more ambitious than the climate policy of the national government. So we had also established a multidisciplinary committee of, for climate change, which is working towards to fulfill the climate pledge. Because cities like Prague are hubs for innovation, science and business and we are in a unique position to become leaders in this progressive investments into a sustainable uh, solutions which will improve quality of life and protect the environment and moreover through the trickle-down effect, these innovations have the potential to spread also in the regions outside of, uh, outside of the cities and other people could also benefit from them. Uh, so this model is even more relevant in the case of COVID pandemic, which of course poses a massive challenge. Because however, we had decided to approach this as an opportunity, an opportunity for innovation, for strengthening the resilience and tackling the climate change as well. Because uh, that's why Prague is a big promoter of the green recovery after COVID, because the economy will need to be supported by investments. And I believe that we need to create conditions for the green investments specifically. So the city itself is investing into the green and sustainable projects. And we also believe that cities like Prague can lead by example and prove that this approach is really feasible and beneficial. So together with other mayors of the V4 capitals, uh, Budapest, Bratislava and Warsaw, we had signed an open letter to the European Commission and to Chancellor Angela Merkel, in which we have endorsed the European Green Deal and the Green Recovery approach. And naturally, political proclamations are not enough. So the city of Prague has been working a lot uh, on the projects in this area of the circular economy, sustainable mobility and uh, building renovations. So we had promised to plant one million of trees in the uh, next uh, eight years in the city. And we have established a new position, uh, that of the manager for sustainable energy. And we are also preparing a Prague cooperative for sustainable energy, which enables the production of green energy, both on the municipal buildings and also on the privately owned buildings. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you. I would like to pass the digital baton now to Liliana Pavlova. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver, uh, dear mayors, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, panelists, colleagues. Uh, I'm really, I'm really glad uh, uh, to, to join this uh, uh, this uh, important, uh, I believe, uh, event and debates, a very timely one. Unfortunately, we cannot all be in person. Uh, on behalf of the European Investment Bank, I, I should say that uh, we, as the EU bank, support very much the, the, the implementation of the European uh, Green Deal by, uh, by investing in uh, sustainable urban transport, social infrastructure, energy efficiency and innovation, and really supporting also urban development and transition of, uh, of, of the cities, and so by, also by so-called local, local Green Deals. Uh, we all have set uh, ambitious uh, climate targets and we specifically as EU Climate Bank also are, are really uh, very much um, targeted uh, to, to, to complement to the implementation and achieving uh, the global EU, to, uh, EU climate targets. Um, in, uh, in, in doing so, we have recently adopted our Climate Bank Roadmap. It, it was adopted last week by our board. It is, uh, uh, it is really the blueprint we as, as the EU Bank uh, are really proposing to tackle this crisis and to ensure that the recovery from the pandemic is green. So this is uh, our Climate Bank Roadmap we will guide our investments over the next 10 years, uh, allowing us to support massive 1 trillion euro of uh, investments like an injection in, uh, of, in, uh, in sustainable development, in green, in green investments, uh, which will, uh, will help us uh, throughout those periods. Uh, our overall uh, ambitious targets over the next decade is really to 50% of our lending to be dedicated to climate and sustainable uh, environmental finance uh, all our investments to be to be Paris aligned as well. So uh, this is this is really important. And in order in order uh, our the EU the EU Green Deal to be to and the goals we have all set and agreed upon to be to be implemented successfully, cities and regions will play a key role. I should say a crucial a crucial role in that process because without the the involvement of the city and, and regions we won't be able to achieve those those targets and uh, those ambitious uh, roles which we are having so uh, this is this is uh, the, the the best way forward because uh, cities as well placed to find really synergies uh, co-benefits be between uh, green investments and really enhanced resilience to to COVID and uh, uh, and to and to future challenges which we have of us and here in the bank, I should say that urban and regional investments are a really an important part of, of our portfolio. One third of total EAB lending is dedicated to urban development. Uh, alone in 2019, we have invested uh, 20, around 20 billion euro in support of urban lending, 40% of which was dedicated to climate action. So uh, really, uh, we are providing lending and financing, but as well as advisory support for to, to the cities and governments and our project promoters in preparing their strategies, identifying their projects, uh, and uh, supporting them also in uh, preparing strong and bankable projects and supporting their implementation, uh, in their, their implementation as well. Uh, therefore, it's really important that uh, that really for the cities to plan in a very in a sustainable and a, in an integrated manner, because really the, it, it is a prerequisite for for the EAB lending. Our our financing tools, like uh, especially the, the the urban framework loans, are well attuned to financing any multi-sectoral investments which are needed in support of of the cities. Uh, development and achieving green and uh, green recovery and, uh, and all targets to uh, which which are set uh, currently. 
In addition to, to what I'm saying about the cities, I, I would like to underline as well that we are also actively supporting the private sector. Uh, Mr. Dvor Dvorak is here and uh, with us today, so uh, uh, we, uh, I can say, uh, I can share that uh, we have an excellent example of a project that we supported and provided 50 million venture debt facility uh, to, to Bolt in the beginning of this year. Uh, supporting uh, them to boost uh, R&D and to develop new projects and uh, Bolt will invest in improving and expanding uh, its uh, right holding technology as well as uh, personalized uh, mobility services like food delivery. So we have excellent examples in supporting private sector as well. So as I said, uh, or maybe as in a conclusion, only, only by acting together we can enhance synergies between public and private sector. Uh, between uh, between uh, between uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, synergies between public and private sector between more advanced and, and less developed uh, regions uh, in order really to, to achieve uh, to improve lives uh, to strengthen resilience to climate change and to to be to be to be, to be able to recover from uh, from the, the crisis and this is a, today is a critical moment and we need to be united in, in that effort and you can count on us, you can count on EMB to support in this endeavor because it is it is a joint journey we are all in and we have to go together ahead. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you and um, Mr Dvorak, it sounds as though I scarcely need to introduce you after that mention. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm here to represent Volt, uh, the European leading mobility platform. Um, our goal is to make uh, the urban travel more affordable, uh, convenient and responsible. Uh, we have over 30 million users across the world, um, mostly in Europe and Africa, um, including Czech Republic, where we are live in eight cities, including here in Prague. Uh, where we actually have ride hailing, uh, you can try one of our beautiful e-bikes or you can order food using our Bolt Food app. Uh, you know, to answer the question of how we can make our cities greener, I think that this can be done uh, following three simple principles. Uh, one would be a vision of a 15-minute city. Uh, second uh, would be, uh, you know, putting different means of transport in one place. And third, it would be a cooperation between the private and the public sector. So uh, what all this actually means, um, vision of a 15 minute city is a pretty popular concept nowadays. Um, it basically says that uh, we should plan and build our cities the way that everything is reachable within either a walking distance or a short bike ride. Um, a great ambassador of this whole idea is the city of Paris today. Um, you know, we would sort of decentralize the city, uh, having these individual individual parts of the city where everything is just behind the corner. So you would eliminate the need for uh, transportation for those long trips, which means trips taken by personal, personally owned cars. Uh, second, um, different means of transport in one place. This is what we do at Bolt. Uh, you know, Bolt has been the first app in the world that actually introduced all ride hailing, e-bikes and e-scooters in one app. And this together with a perfect, uh, perfectly functioning public transportation system, such as the one we have here in Prague, uh, can make the best alternative because people still need to move. So you first reduce the need for those long trips and then you replace uh, the rest of the trips taken by cars by uh, having a great availability of a public transport and then to cover the rest of the use cases such as, I don't know, if you go to the hospital uh, or if you just are in a rush, you can take uh, ride hailing or for your short trips you take either a bike or a scooter. And then uh, last I mentioned the cooperation between the private and the public sector. I think, you know, from the public sector side it's rather about letting it's sort of uh, about creating the uh, the regulatory framework uh, within which the companies can 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 move and then uh, and can adopt those changes so they're not blocked by certain old uh, legislations etc and then uh, from the pub uh, from the sorry from the private sector side it's about being a responsible player to respect the city um, 
to give an example of how this can look like, we recently launched e-bikes here in Prague. It's been a month ago. Um, so what we did before we actually launched the bikes, uh, we would speak to every single individual Prague district from Prague 1 to Prague 10. Then we would speak to the city hall and then we would deploy the bikes. Uh, we are also the only app here in Prague that uh, have designated parking spots. So we wouldn't let you park the bike anywhere you like but we actually force you to park the bike in those dedicated parking spots. And again, all those spots have been agreed with the city districts. Uh, on top of that, we introduced our, um, our vision uh, for uh, sustainable development, sustain a sustainable way of doing business, which is called our green plan. And uh, this is our long-term commitment to um, eliminate, uh, to reduce our ecological footprint by first uh, reducing, reducing uh, CO2 of all European um, ride-hailing rights and uh, by bringing, uh, you know, sustainable uh, transportation solutions such as e-bikes or scooters as we do, for example, here in Czech Republic. So yeah, uh, that would be how we actually see we can make our cities greener. Well, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for their admirable discipline in keeping their contributions to more or less four minutes. I appreciate it's not easy. Um, following on from Jakob's mention of the concept of the 15 minute city, and in particular of Paris, which um, underwent fairly radical urban surgery at the hands of Baron Haussmann in the 19th century, um, and then by subsequent planners, I'd like to ask each of the panelists um, to what extent they think this concept is really a practical one that can be implemented without similarly radical um, planning reform or expense or upheaval. And um, perhaps we could begin with Mayor Jib. Yes, thank you very much for this question. Uh, the fact is that the concept, this concept is already embedded into our coalition declaration here in Prague. Although we do not call it a 15 minute city, we call it uh, uh, we want to make the city multicentric and we want to make the city of the city of short distances which is basically the same thing uh, because the problem of prague in fact is that the prague is very monocentric city it's got, it's got one center and everything else is outside of the center so this is a thing of uh, urban development and it's definitely a long-term run however I think that uh, the deputy mayor uh, who is in charge of the urban development is doing a very good job on this. And, however, we will see the results in a few years. Liliana, would you like to contribute? Um, I don't know if it's just me, but I'm having trouble hearing you can you hear me now yes you're coming through clearly now okay thank you thank you very much uh well uh, as i said uh, uh, i do believe that uh, urban planning uh, should be should be done in a in a sustainable in a in a in an integrated manner so the idea of 15 minute city it's it's a very it's a, a very good idea on one side and and maybe COVID COVID era uh, might uh, might be the perfect moment uh, for for this idea uh, uh, to, to be implemented. On the other side, we should be careful and should be cautious because uh, it might mean uh, that we have to undo uh, quite a lot of investments, a decade of investments of. And uh, the, this kind of industrial uh, industrialization and economic development and urban planning, which was focused on uh, siloing uh, different um, activities uh, uh, in uh, in distinct parts of the cities. So uh, I believe a very uh, a very uh, very coherent and balanced approach is needed whenever the new planning is is done. So it is. Uh, so it is. It also to ensure that it's done in a very sustainable way, and and really the, it will not uh, will not would not lead to kind of really undoing those uh, uh, decades of uh, huge investments and then starting all over from scratch. So really, we need to find the best synergies and uh, and really to have a balanced approach. 
Jaku, perhaps with your professional experience, you could explain a little about how you've seen mobility patterns change over the past nine months and how that might in turn alter the calculus of, of urban planning in the future. We've seen uh, the COVID crisis had a obviously significant impact on uh, the transportation world. Um, I think everyone can see it uh, in the streets of their own city. Uh, we dropped by 80% uh, during the pandemic and we stayed uh, at this level for uh, many, many weeks. And uh, we still in certain cities haven't uh, fully recovered, which again can actually be seen uh, when you walk across those cities. And that's why, you know, I think that actually the time to act, uh, to, to make this green transition is now. Because if we wait, if we let the traffic to get back to the city, it will be very hard to make those changes. But if we do it now, uh, and we actually create, I mean, we, we, we stop letting cars to go everywhere, and, and, and we build the cities for, the, for, for, for people, uh, for, the, for the cyclists, I don't know, for the scooters, uh, not for the cars, uh, we, can, we can really help it. But again, it will be hard if we let all the cars to get back. Uh, we need to do it as soon as possible. Thank you. And Judith, is the 15 minute city something that Leeds City Council has considered or even wired explicitly into its policy agenda? Um, no, I can honestly say that um, that it isn't so far. Um, however, I think the pandemic is really um, enabling everyone to have some serious rethink about how we live and work and travel. Um, Leeds uh, covers a very wide geographic area and actually is probably made up of a collection of villages going back over the centuries. Um, obviously, with um, more people working at home, the district centres around the city have seen um, a, a very interesting increase in people staying local, shopping locally. Um, but bas basically, um, Leeds, like um, most other U UK cities, is uh, very heavily dependent on its city centre in terms of the location of um, employment, um, particularly office space, um, and the transport infrastructure. So I think it's it's a, a, an interesting moment for us in actually analysing what the long term impact of the pandemic will be and how we can make our smaller communities more sustainable and more relevant. But um, I have to say that it, it isn't um, an idea that has really caught on um, here yet, but um, we'll certainly be looking at it and explore the potential of it. Thank you. And um, another question for all of the panellists. It strikes me that there are two ways of thinking about the impact of the pandemic on this discussion. And the first is, as Mayor Jib put it, that um, this crisis is also an opportunity that we're seeing state bodies mobilising enormous and in some cases unprecedented resources for things like green technology and infrastructure, and that people seem to be really open to the idea of change. Green spaces have become very valuable to them. Um, on the other hand, um, there is also the downside, which is that um, in many ways after the first lockdown in many cities, life to some extent went back to normal in some places. Financial resources are constrained and people are having to prioritise and things like health and the economic recovery are not always um, in harmony with the green agenda. And so um, I'd like each panelist, please, to um, set out where they think the balance lies between this crisis as a, a break on the green transition and an accelerant of it. And um, perhaps we could start with Liliana. Uh, I do believe that, uh, in fact, it's, it's not a break. It's just an, it's indeed an accelerant of the, of the green transition. And uh, we should use that momentum because uh, it's indeed a window of, window of opportunity uh, and uh, it's, it's a kind of a transformation of the way we live and the, the way we work. Uh, and um, people have already really not only uh, rethinked the way we, they, they, they live, but already have, have used to uh, and really changing uh, the, the way they, they will go to work. I mean, switching uh, to more walking or cycling, not using cars for short distancing, so, uh, relying on public uh, on public transport more, uh, and even even change the way they spend their free time. I mean, uh, 
uh, exploring uh, nature, spending more time in nature rather than just uh, traveling long distances or, or airplanes and uh, uh, longer expensive uh, vacations. So completely changed the way we live. And uh, we need to, uh, to acknowledge all efforts uh, also done by, by the cities and, uh, and local authorities uh, like pop-up uh, bicycle lanes and all their efforts. They were temporary ones. And now I believe all of us, we need to support them financially and uh, with all the additional measures, uh, uh, really to those, all those temporary measures to become a permanent one. Uh, and, and uh, a sustainable one uh, in order really to promote this greening of the of, 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 of cities of uh, changing uh, and our urban mobility systems so this is this is a, a very very excellent opportunity for, for for all of us I believe Jakob from a private spe private sector perspective um, do you see any possible downsides in terms of the green transition? Um, resulting from the pandemic? Not really, to be honest. Um, I definitely agree uh, here with the, with the vice president. Um, I mean, if you check the studies, uh, you can actually see that uh, the economic growth uh, typically comes from the parts of the city where actually uh, privately owned cars or cars in general just simply cannot go because people uh, tend to spend more time in those areas. So it also creates uh, certain uh, economic opportunities. And, you know, that's, I think, what this is all about. Um, during the crisis, and if I may follow up on the previous question as well, uh, we've seen that people would prefer more and more those uh, different individual means of transport. I'm talking e-bikes, I'm talking uh, scooters, and this is why we also uh, decided to become uh, the biggest micromobility provider uh, next year here in Europe by investing 100 million euros into micromobility, having uh, 100, 130,000 bikes and scooters across different uh, cities in the uh, uh, in Europe because we actually believe that this is the opportunity and we believe that not only the companies but also the cities will react to that the same way. Judith, has the pandemic raised any challenging trade-offs for your council in policy terms or has it all been um, opportunity rather than break? Um, well, it's in terms of um, the people that we represent, I think the pandemic has, has exposed um, some new divides, if you like. So, um, in terms of the fact that the um, pandemic has been most successful in areas of high deprivation, areas where people live in very, really overcrowded housing conditions, um, and I think one of the biggest divides that we've we've had is for people who have their own personal um, garden space against those who don't. Um, and it's through that that we've seen um, a real upsurge in um, the use of our local parks, for example. So I think um, the, the, you know, perhaps there's been a real opportunity to explore the assets, the, the green assets that we have on our own doorstep that perhaps we've ignored. So we know that we have neglected land that could be used for, um, the, for people. Um, to be able to enjoy their leisure time and just to um, to get some space. I think the, the biggest in difference in terms of um, government policy and investment has been um, in the area of active travel. So investment in um, um, widening the pavements, for example, so there's more space for people to move about safely, um, which has reduced the um, amount of space for vehicles on the road, which is an interesting one also in uh, money to um, invest in temporary provision for cycle lanes for example um, and a real active um, effort to um, to keep the habits that developed during the pandemic i think everyone was absolutely amazed at the transformation of air quality during the first lockdown and it was absolutely unbelievable in terms of the clarity of the air, you could, you could, the taste of the air, every, everything, and the, the way that um, um, wildlife was thriving and coming into our urban areas in ways that we hadn't seen before. And of course, the, the real risk is um, that we still have um, a ba um, a, a advice that you should only use public transport if it's a, for essential use. Um, and unfortunately, we have seen more people buying second-hand cars 
for example, and of course they have um, older technology. Um, so a lot of um, conflicting um, impacts that we, we're trying to assess, but um, we have seen a drop in emissions in the city um, and we're very keen to make sure that that continues and that we can continue um, with our own investment in electric vehicles, but also encouraging um, our businesses and other transport operators, taxi firms, um, to continue that investment as well. I'm really sorry, I'm going to have to leave the call now. I'm so sorry. Well, thank you very much indeed for your contribution. I'm very glad that you could be with us. Thank you. I'm sorry, it's, I've, had to, I've, I've had to cut it short, but thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the time. Goodbye. Thank you from everyone. Thank and um, may I share the word opportunity was yours, but um, is it possible that there is a rhetorical trap here where we fall into um, a mood of over optimism and don't spend enough time thinking about the, the possible setbacks that could arise to the green transition as a result of the pandemic? Well, the possible setbacks, I would like to, um, uh, to maybe return it back a little bit. Well, the fact is that the post-COVID era will be definitely different in many ways in terms of transportation and also the, uh, it poses a huge challenges on the urban development because definitely there will be most likely a less demand for the office space because there will be a more home office opportunities. This means that there will be less commuting. That means a lot of changes in the mobility. Also, change. this means a change for the urban development because there will be less office space necessary in the city. But also, it will need uh, another changes in the city. For example, to support the direct delivery of the goods. So, we had, for example, opened a new depot for the courier companies or delivery companies in the city centre. So, they could use for the last mile uh, deliver using the e-bikes, uh, cargo e-bikes in Prague. This is quite a new thing, but uh, I think we can see the changes already happening right now, also in the, in the public transport. Uh, however, I think that it's quite hard to uh, presume all the changes that will be necessary. However, for those we can see, we should prepare as much as possible. Thank you very much. We have a little time left for questions from the audience. And um, perhaps given that we do have very little time, um, it would be best if they could be addressed to individual panelists. Yeah, thank you, Oliver, for this uh, lovely discussion and for, for all this interesting points of view and opinions. And yes, I'm back and I'm here with the questions uh, from uh, you, from the audience, and we'll try to find the answers. So our first question, should Prague implement a carbon toll on cars entering its territory? I think this is the right question for Mr. Hrib. Well, this question has been discussed in previous years in Prague and the fact is that uh, we've got a sort of legislation deficit for such a thing and uh, mm, there is also a sort of parallel idea of having the, uh, the toll system or uh, the low emission zone in the city. And right now it seems that the more favorable idea is uh, the toll system. We would eventually need that in Prague due to other, other, uh, due to other requirements. Because actually, to complete the urban, uh, the urban circle, the road circle, we will have to have the toll system. But right now, we do not have the legislation, so there is a lot of work that has to be done and uh, a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you very much. If you, if you let me, I'll stay by you with another question, because uh, it's, it's the question that wasn't put only once. Uh, more people ask the same thing. And one is, how did the pandemic influence the funding for municipal programs aimed at climate action? 
Well, I don't think that uh, we would cut the funds for the climate uh, uh, for the climate action. Uh, in fact, yes, the COVID pandemic poses enormous budgetary challenge for us. We need to do a lot of uh, cut costing, uh, sorry, cost cutting activities. However. Uh, for the good things, we will eventually find the money, or at least I hope so. So uh, we are basically staying online with our former projects, like, uh, for example, the one million of trees for the city. This is uh, this is a target that we would like to meet, and. Uh, there is a lot of other projects I've mentioned in the in the previous speech, like uh, this uh, cooperative organization to make sure that we can produce the energy on both the municipal and privately owned buildings. So we will definitely still invest into the green projects, into the green innovations for the city. And there is actually a new organization that... Uh, uh, sort of takes part in this and that's the Prague Innovation Institute uh, which is taking care about certain projects in this area. Thank you very much. I've got here one more question for Mr. Dvořák. Uh, how can we make we four cities more cycling friendly? <laughs> that's a great question. Um, and again I think I think we've mentioned it before and uh, this is again to take this opportunity we currently have, uh, thanks to not having that many cars in the city, and make those changes. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, Mr. Mayor here mentioned that uh, they would like to uh, sort of uh, allow only certain cars to you know, enter uh, either the city or the uh, or the city center. But you know, it's important to realize that um, an electric car, for example, I mean, it's still a car. It's still not efficient. It's two-ton vehicle moving typically one to maximum four people, right? Maximum five, all right. Um, but what we can do, and what I hope that there will be tools, but I don't know, <laughs> uh, would be uh, to create those zones where not only low carbon vehicles, but only light vehicles would go. So people, bikes, and scooters. Thank you very much. Thank you for your answer.